Pinkita was born in Mexico and grew up in California being blind and undocumented. He advocates for the rights of blind children and their parents in the public school setting through a lens of intersectionality focusing on social justice. Conchita received her bachelor's degree from St. Mary's College of California, majoring in international studies, Spanish, and history. She went on to Louisiana Tech University, where she received her master's in teaching with a focus on teaching blind students. As well, Conchita earned a certificate in working with deaf blind students from Northern Illinois University. She's currently a doctorate student at George Washington University, pursuing her degree in special education. Here's Conchita. Um, language is so when we talk about the doctor folks, we want to use a doctor or we can say we have first, but we never use the word illegal. Um, I'm sure we've heard like no human being is illegal. Um, for some statistics, so 11.4 million undocumented immigrants in the U.S. Um, are currently living here, or 3.5% of the population. And if we take the statistic that one in four um, people have a disability, then we can say about three million of the undocumented population is disabled. Um, there are currently no statistics being kept on the intersection of undocumented and disability. Um, and so we kind of have to do our own work. Um, so 7.7% of K-12 students have an undocumented parent. Um, so this means a lot of different things. Um, it means uh, issues of mental health um, for children. It means separation of families, where um, parents can be deported and because children are American citizens, um, they have no means of reunifying as a family. And so a lot of times, children end up being put into foster care. And so they, um, you know, they have parents that want to take care of them, but they can't. And so it causes a lot of stress. Um, even within families that are living in the states, because you know you don't know if this in this scenario that's going to happen in your family. Um, access to healthcare and services. So undocumented folk um, are not eligible for the Affordable Care Act. Um, are not eligible for most public assistance, like 99 percent of anything to do with public assistance. Um, and so rehabilitation is a little tricky because technically. Rehabilitation is an eligibility program and not a benefit program. So technically, um, undocumented folks could apply, but most states have implemented also legal status qualifications in order to apply. So it's more a state by state basis. Um, I only know two states that actually give services to undocumented folks. Um, so this is something that's really important to keep in mind um, as disabled people and how you know, we provide service and how, um, as a community, we outreach to individuals that can access through the regular means. Um, this is where centers on independent living or SILs across the country um, can provide services to undocumented folks. So there's no qualification or anything that um, makes them ineligible. So as disabled people, we need to um, kind of be vigilant and make sure that that's happening and that we're broadcasting to these communities um, that we're going to um, kind of know about SILs and what they do. Um, talk about race and country of religion. So 55% of the undocumented folks are from Mexico, 22% are from Central and South America, and 22% are from Asia, Europe, and Africa. Um, so keeping in mind kind of how race plays a role and that, you know, there are black undocumented folks, there are Asian undocumented folks, and we need to include them in the narratives when we talk about um, you know, undocumented being disabled. Um, one of the things that ends up happening in the uh, undocumented community is there's this narrative of the dreamer where it's this kind of ideal immigrant that um, you know, goes to college and works really hard and is able to do all of these things. And while that's great, um, it can be really 
negative for the rest of the community because not everybody fits that uh, paradigm and it really has negative consequences. Uh, for example, uh, President Obama um, passed the um, DACA, which gives um, undocumented folks who graduated from high school in the United States um, access to work permits, social security number. It does not give any type of legal status. There is no such thing as a path to citizenship. Um, but so it was only given to these three group folks. And so part of that was because um, self-identified uh, dreamers of really well the streets march and doing a lot of really awesome work. But what ended up happening is the rest of our community was completely left out. Um, so a lot of people of color, a lot of um, day laborers, people with disabilities were not included in this um, relief system because of kind of this dreamer narrative that we all need to be kind of this perfect immigrant. Um, and it kind of happens in the disability community as well, where, you know, the good disabled folk, you know, are the ones that try really hard and are able to overcome. And so that's kind of the negative um, image we're loving away from because every single person kind of is capable of, you know, living a life that they want to live and um, should be treated with dignity. Um, so one of the things we need to keep in mind is that immigration policy in the country has been um, racially ex exclusionary from the beginning. So the premise of immigration in this country, um, immigration policy, is based on the fact of displacement and genocide um, of people. So this land um, was stolen from Native Americans, and um, you know the enslavement of um, black people and all of the horrible things that have happened in order for uh, white Americans to be able to claim citizenship. And so some of these things, um, the Page Act of 1875 was an exclusion um, that excluded Asian women from entering the country because it was the assumption that, oh, if women come, then they're going to have babies and they're going to have to be white, so that's not what we want. Um, and that kind of worked in the way that they wanted it to work. And so then the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 also um, created people from entering the country based on race because that is not kind of the white that they wanted it coming inside. Um, the United States Naturalization Law of 1790 excluded American Indians, indentured servants, slaves, free blacks, and agents to apply for citizenship. Um, so pretty much anybody that was not white um, could, did not have citizenship. Um, so immigration, race labels are kind of something that have happened in the last 100 years where um, kind of labeling kind of what race you are um, and the specific ones that we have now are kind of in the last 100 years and they're very limiting um, in that they don't really give the scope of the diversity where people come from and you don't have options um, that are very fit. Um, in 1898, the U.S. started granting citizenship to all people born in the United States. So before this, um, unless you were white, you were not granted citizenship, even if you were born in the country. Um, Native Americans were not granted citizenship, citizenship until 1924, um, which is ridiculous because this is Native American land. Um, in 1940, nationalization was extended to Filipino, Chinese, and Indian. Um, and pe people and their children. Um, in 1952, discrimination based on race, gender um, was prohibited. Um, and so that's fairly recently. And it's not to say that there isn't discrimination, it's that um, there isn't like these laws that prohibit people coming in based on race. Um, even though it does happen, but not on an institutional level. Um, nationalization, there was a nationalization act of 1970, which extended nationalization to so when you think about when that is, it's very, very recently. Um, and tying into um, the next part, which is the prison industrial context and institutionalization. So um, as the earlier presentation mentioned, there's a lot of immigrant detention centers in the United States. Um, and we actually, in the United States, have the world's largest immigrant detention system with more than 200 centers. Um, 62% are subcontracted to the private prison system based on the quota system 
Um, so it's the same thing with the private prison system, um, you know, too many people being incarcerated, specifically people of color, and this is the exact same thing with undocumented folks. Um, so what does it look like inside kind of a detention center? So there's conditions of denial of medical care, um, accommodations, and legal counsel. Um, and so there's a lot of different organizations that are kind of detention watch networks, and they kind of check on actually what's happening, and really horrible conditions have been found to be inside immigration detention centers. Um, any person, when they are taken to an immigrant detention center, they're shackled. Um, and while definitely no person should be shackled, um, it becomes pertinent to disabled folks because there's no, um, there's no like way of saying like, oh no, I can't be shackled. Um, like there's just, it's really not any system where you have any say. Um, and so if you have a physical disability or um, anything else that it would be really traumatic for you, it's it's not taking into account every single person shackled. Um, and so I have a friend who has a physical disability and they couldn't figure out how to shackle him um, because of the way his arms are. And um, and so it was just really very dehumanizing and something that we kind of need to know as disabled folk. Um, when it comes to detention for LGBT and trans individuals, um, it's a, a, also a really horrific system. Um, so detention is not based on gender identity, but rather anatomy. So this is really horrific um, conditions for trans and LGBT individuals, where uh, trans and LGBT individuals um, are sexually assaulted 15 times more than your person in um, other groups and detention centers. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of sexual assault in detention, detention centers, um, and it's just very much a high for trans and LGBT identified individuals. Um, one way that detention centers kind of deal with this is they place uh, trans folks in solitary confinement uh, for safety so that they won't be um, hurt by other individuals. And so this is really putting more trauma on what has already happened. Um, and there's you know lack of services as well and access, so lack of medications needed, um, lack of services, lack of some anything that has to do with them being able to be kind of in their identities. Um, so asylum seekers, there's um, asylum seekers um, who come kind of to the border and then seek asylum. Um, so there's no kind of accommodations or really mobility um, for people who need them. Um, and there's really no services or resources available. Uh, they have to navigate a court system kind of without legal defense or lawyer. And so a lot of times people with disabilities don't, um, aren't able to navigate the system. The majority of asylum seekers are actually deported back, are not granted asylum. And so um, there's an actual whatever country that they are originally from. And a lot of times um, that is really a death sentence for people. Um, and so you can seek asylum for a lot of different reasons. Um, LGBT identity is definitely one of them. Um, so is kind of access to disability sources. So if that's the case and the majority of people are then denied access um, and then being deported back, then it's just another really horrible condition. Um, so I have some pictures of um, the detention centers, and there's I'm going to describe it. There's one picture where there's a bunch of um, it's kind of a sleeping quarter, and what was found by these immigrant watch networks is that you know there really aren't beds. It depends from detention center to detention center, but this specific one, people are on the ground. Um, kind of really close proximity, um, there's no mattress, uh, the blankets are kind of makeshift, whatever it is that you have. Um, and so when we think about disabled folks being in detention centers and kind of what that looks like, um, if you have a physical disability or if you have chronic pain or um, something where you really need a mattress or some type of comfort, it's, it's not provided. Um, and so 
um, a lot of times people get sick in detention centers. Um, as was mentioned in the earlier presentation, people become disabled um, on their way to getting to the United States. And so um, it, there really is this much in the detention center it kind of makes the problem worse because now they're in the detention center where they don't have um, access to resources, uh, services, or kind of just basic things such as a mattress for them to sleep on. Um, I have another picture. So there is no age limit for detention. So I, there's lots and lots of children in detention. Um, there's babies, there's toddlers. Um, in one picture, it's literally pretty much a cage um, that the, this particular detention center has where the children are kind of sleeping on the floor, um, kind of being escaped in. Um, so when we think about kind of mental health and um, having children specifically be kind of in detention centers, it's something that is a really big issue. Um, and they're not provided with the services that they need. Um, so it's already been a traumatizing thing to be able to kind of get to the United States and then when they get here, being uh, locked up. And there's no time limit in the time that you can spend in a detention center. So, you know, kids grow up in a detention center. Um, you can be there from a week to two weeks, a month, a year, or multiple years. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, policing. So there's a program called Secure Communities, and what it is um, is local law enforcement works with uh, ICE, which is the Immigration and Customs Enforcement, together. Um, so what this means is um, really a lot of horrible racial profiling by police, um, which they already do to communities of color, um, and what. What it comes down to is they can stop somebody who they presume to be undocumented, and they um, they can ask them for their documentation, and they can turn them over to ICE. And so what ends up happening is um, there already is no trust with police, um, and that's a whole other conversation about uh, police brutality and kind of the horrible systems that are in place there. Um, and what ends up happening is people don't call police for things like domestic violence. Um, and whereas I don't think police should ever be called, um, there aren't systems in place um, that have kind of an alternative. And so a lot of immigrants kind of don't call the police um, for like police um, for domestic violence or other issues that happen. Um, and so they continue to stay in. Uh, really bad situations and the breakdowns really bad. Um, so that's something we need to know about that it is happening in our communities. Um, so some places have decided to opt out of the program of secure communities, um, and it just makes a really big difference where people um, are frightened to kind of walk outside into the community and are afraid to, um, you know, be a part of their schools and neighborhoods. And so it's something that we really need to um, make sure that every place is opting out secure communities. Um, and so that leads, of course, to police brutality. Um, and the town that I'm from specifically, in California, um, there's a really lot of instances um, with police um, killing of, um, you know, people who they perceive to be documented, whether they are or they aren't, um, because of the power dynamics that exists with police. Uh, so mental health is a really big, um, a really big thing that's really important in the undocumented community, and just all the trauma that exists um, with kind of the experience. Um, and so we need to really be cognizant of that and how we can better make sure that our communities are receiving the mental health help that they need. Um, I think a lot of times this is a good example of where the dreamer narrative can be really negative because this whole dreamer narrative of like if you work hard and you just are a good immigrant then you can do well. And so people end up saying like, oh yeah, I experienced something really horrible, but um but you know I just need to keep working hard. And so they kind of put all the issues that happened away so they're not able to um, kind of 
receive um, you know, mental help that they need either within their communities or professionally. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, so I am originally from Mexico. I moved to the United States when I was four years old with my family. Um, we're five siblings. And the main reason we moved to the United States was because um, of my disability. And so myself and my brother were blind. And my parents were under um, the assumption that, you know, we go to the United States, we're going to be able to get more services and more access um, to services um, and a good education. So we were told we were coming to Disneyland, and um, that was kind of the story that we told. So we got, we had travel visas, which is the main way that people become undocumented. And so we had visas in the United States. Um, I waited to go to Disneyland, and it never happened. <laughs> and um, and so we just overstayed our visa. Um, we renewed for a couple of years, and then someone told us if you renew and then you, you get denied, then you will um, not be eligible, um, you know, to stay in the country. You will be deported. So we decided to just overstay our visas, and I think a myth that a lot of people think is like, well, why didn't you just, um, you know, do it the right way and wait in line? Um, and the thing is, there is no line. There's no such thing as a path to citizenship. Um, there is no way for anybody to gain citizenship in this country um, if you're undocumented, um, unless you seek asylum, and the majority of people that seek asylum are deported, um, or if you marry an American citizen. And so that's the reality of kind of how immigration works. Um, so I grew up um, kind of in school in the United States. Um, I didn't know the language, so when we got here, it was kind of a language, being stable, um, kind of going through the educational system. And um, there was a lot of policing in the town that I'm from, and it was before secure communities, but it was definitely already something that was happening. And so um, there was a lot of kind of fear within the communities that, like, um, there would be raids where um, ICE, which is the Immigration and uh, Customs Enforcement, kind of shows up and just picks up people. Um, and so it can be a church, it can be a school, it can be um, a community center, it can be, uh, it's normally at places, um, at workplaces where a lot of day laborers are, um, are at. And so if a parent has um, you know, doesn't have legal status and a child does, then what ends up happening is, um, as I mentioned earlier, the parent gets reported and the child gets put into foster care. Um, and so I ended up going to school, and um, my senior year in high school, I was, you know, getting ready to apply for college, and um, and they were like, well, you can't really go to college because you're not documented. And so I. I knew I was undocumented, but I was just so disappointed because it's something that I really wanted to do. Um, so I ended up getting, I actually no longer undocumented. Um, my parents ended up getting divorced, and one of my parents ended up getting married, um, and so I was able to get documentation through one of my parents. Um, but it came after kind of a whole application process to college. And so I, um, I ended up going to a college that wasn't really my choice, um, and I wasn't eligible for a, a lot of financial aid. Um, and so I ended up going to college. Um, but because I was also documented when I was graduating from college, I didn't receive any information about rehabilitation services because I wasn't documented. So I didn't uh, understand kind of how that whole system worked. And so my whole undergrad was spent um, kind of not receiving any services and kind of trying to navigate that all on my own. So um, kind of going into that, the whole idea that you know disability rights are, you know, every other type of right or documented rights um, are poor people's rights, are people of color's rights, um, and we need to kind of be in solidarity with each other. 
so that we can um, so, so that we can all work towards equality and um, liberation. Because if we're only working towards this idea of kind of as our early presenter was talking about, um, that disability doesn't end up being a really white led space. Um, and so we need to be able to make sure that everybody's voice is included um, in, in all of the discussions that we have. So what are some kind of specific things we can do to show solidarity? So the first one is um, we can become aware of the issue and kind of learn more about it and how it affects um, disabled folks and what it is that we can do to make sure that we are not continuing to hard to um, The next thing we can do is not holding meetings um, in government buildings that require a formal form of identification. So um, some states let undocumented immigrants um, get like licenses and IDs, but it's not everywhere and it's still problematic because um, they can be the IDs can still be labeled in a certain way, um, or there can be just the problem with fear of going into that space. Um, and so we need to be sure that when we're having meetings, we're not doing that. Um, traveling to conferences. So undocumented immigrants cannot um, leave the country, but you can travel within the United States. Um, but even so, there's still kind of the fear of traveling um, because what if, you know, TSA asks you for some documentation and, um, you know, they do have authority uh, to call it. It's not supposed to happen, but it does happen. And so just the fear that it might happen, um, and it has happened to people, makes people really wary of travel. Um, so doing like streaming of your events um, is really great. Um, another thing we can do to show solidarity is, solidarity is finding ways for undocumented folks to access services. Um, so like independent living centers are a good way um, because rehabilitation is not an option. Um, and really community-based sharing is really, really important. Um, where we teach each other instead of like having some professional tell us what we're supposed to know. Um, and so making sure we're creating spaces of community sharing about kind of what we know um, and making it accessible to people. Um, getting in contact with detention centers in your area to make sure people receive accommodations. Um, and so there's already organizations that work on behalf of immigrants that have access to detention centers. Um, and they are not necessarily focused on disability. So getting in contact with these organizations and making sure that um, that there's some things of conversation happening about disability um, is really, really important. Um, and also providing language justice at all events. Um, so language justice means um, anything to do with making language accessible. So like, for example, American Sign Language card, um, but also uh, language um, like Spanish and um, you know Chinese and kind of knowing the community that you're in and making sure you're providing uh, language access in those communities um, so that they can access the services because a lot of times um, like the most marginalized groups are the ones that you know that we need to support and they're not really being included in conferences or conversations because they don't have access to the language. Um, there's also another way we can show solidarity is some states um, don't give students with disabilities high school diplomas. Um, they give students with disabilities like certificates, um, and that has to make um, students ineligible for the DACA program, um, which gives the documented students um, the ability to get a work permit and social security number. So when this um, conversation comes up about kind of the whole high school diploma thing for students with disabilities. Um, we need to bring up undocumented folks because while it might seem like a good option to go the certificate route, um, it really leaves them out of being able to access a job or pretty much anything else. So we need to make sure that we're being advocates um, for um, undocumented folks so that places are awful giving out high school diplomas to students with disabilities. Um, there's also Muslims in immigrant detention facilities, um, and 
this is actually a direct quote I have from my friend Alexander Rosha, who works a lot with um, against Islamophobia and um, a lot of institutions in place. So her direct quote is um, incorporate Muslims with disabilities in the work on disability justice. The majority of individuals targeted by FBI informants and entrapped to serve long prison sentences for maximum security facilities um, have mental disabilities. So just keeping in mind um, how we are perpetuating, perpetuating the um, Islamophobia in our communities and within um, kind of all the systems that are in place. Um, and also working, another way to consider solidarity is working with local organizations to keep secure communities out of your area. Um, so there's a lot of different organizations, community rights um, advocates and um, activists that are doing work around making sure that places are not participating in the Secure Communities Program. And um, as people with disabilities, um, we need to kind of join in that so that we, um, you know, show solidarity to undocumented folks and people with disabilities that are being targeted and can't, um, you know, physically be in, in their communities um, because they will be targeted by police. Um, so I have some resources um, for people who are more interested in learning more about the issue. So there's the Detention Watch Network. So they're really big in kind of calling out the detention centers in all the ways in which they are really being inhumane and um, what are ways that can be approved. Um, there's a really good book uh, that if you're interested on uh, how race-based immigration has worked in the United States. And it's called The Myth of the Huddled Masses by Kevin Johnson. Um, so I recommend that if that's something that you're interested in. Um, there's another organization called United We Dream, and they really focus on um, kind of immigrant rights and undocumented folks, and it's led by undocumented folks. Um, and so that's kind of where we need to show our support, where people are kind of leading um, in their own area. Um, and there's a, a movie called um, Don't Tell Anyone or Noni Viva San Adie, um, that is by, um, that was a girl named Angie who is undocumented and kind of her activism and her um, kind of sexual assault and how that plays a role. So if you're kind of interested in that intersection, um, it's a really good movie. Um, so if you want to get in contact with me, um, my Twitter is Conchita HTZ, so C-O-N-C-H-I-T-A-H-T-Z. Um, or you can email me, and um, the organizer is tasked to my phone now. So I don't know if we have type of questions or anything. Thank you.